agroforestry provides a wide range of benefits to landowners specifically and society as a whole generally. Some of these benefits are well known and obvious, while others are less obvious but just as important. Today we're going to learn about some of the ecosystem services and wildlife benefits of agroforestry practices and systems. Before we begin, I would like to thank Jomi Zamora, Extension Educator at the University of Minnesota, and Sibu Jose, Director of the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri, for the use of some of their slides. Many of you may be wondering, just who is Trees Forever? Well, Trees Forever is a 501c3 nonprofit in both Iowa and Illinois. The organization was founded in 1989 and currently has a staff of 22, roughly split between office personnel and field staff located through both states. The mission of Trees Forever is to plant and care for trees and the environment by empowering people, building community, and promoting stewardship. Since our inception, Trees Forever has planted over 3.4 million trees, engages an average of 7,000 volunteers annually, and on average, each year provides approximately $600,000 in pass-through grant funding for grants and on-site technical assistance. We work in urban forestry, growing community forests. We work with native grasses and flowers in our roadsides and across the rural landscape. We work with partners across Iowa and Illinois to improve water quality through agroforestry and other conservation practices. And we plant it forward by training volunteers and leaders to manage and care for trees in communities all across Iowa and Illinois. As alluded to earlier, agroforestry provides a range of benefits to landowners specifically and society as a whole. Water quality and wildlife benefits often come to mind, and we'll get to them in just a minute. But I'd like to touch briefly on some production benefits. Primarily, because agroforestry practices are too often thought of as taking land out of production, and thus reducing farm income. In reality, it is simply a different kind of production that can enhance farm income and or diversify an operation, thus mitigating risk. Let's take a more detailed look at alley cropping benefits. Alley cropping can reduce crop evapotranspiration by 15 to 30 percent and increase water content in the tillage layer by 5 to 15 percent. Many crops, including traditional row crops, may show a 10 to 20 percent increase in yield depending upon the crop and spacing distance. When field windbreaks are suggested to landowners, a mental image of crop reduction and or loss adjacent to the windbreak is envisioned, and production lost for the space that the windbreak takes up. What is often not recognized is the potential for increased crop quality and quantity on the leeward or downwind side of the windbreak. If you look closely at this photo, you will see that the size of the corn tends to increase the greater the distance from the windbreak. Many years of field research has shown that there is a yield advantage for many crops when protected by a windbreak. This yield increase generally occurs on the leeward or downwind side of the windbreak. The amount of the yield increase will vary from year to year due to different weather conditions and there will also be some variation due to soil type and the types of trees used in the windbreak. However, the take-home message here is that the yield advantage is normally more than enough to offset the decrease in yield immediately adjacent to the windbreak 
and the land occupied by the windbreak itself. Agroforestry has significant water quality benefits associated with roots in the ground all year long. This series of graphs shows some of the reductions in field runoff, sedimentation, surface nitrogen runoff, and subsurface nitrate losses, comparing row crops to grass buffers and agroforestry practices. Because of the roots in the ground all year long, grass buffers and agroforestry practices show significant reductions in nitrogen and phosphorus pollution compared to the control. Further research has provided some numerical ranges for reductions in total nitrogen, nitrate, total phosphorus, and dissolved phosphorus. Again, these reductions are real and significant, and represent the type of reductions necessary to achieve the goals set out in the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy. Trees planted on contour trap sediment and residue, along with attached nutrients and chemicals. Infiltration increases in tree rows, which decreases overland flow and associated movement of soluble nutrients and chemicals to our waterways. Agroforestry increases net carbon storage in the soil and vegetation. With terrestrial ecosystems, the soil stores the greatest amount of soil carbon, and due to past agriculture activities, notably tillage, much of this carbon has been lost. Restoring soil organic carbon on depleted soils is the fastest way to sequester carbon. Adding a tree component to the management of the land increases the potential for carbon storage. When broken down into sectors, U.S. cropland can sequester about 75 to 200 million metric tons of atmospheric carbon per year by using current best management practices. Shifting to grazing land, U.S. grazing can sequester 30 to 90 million metric tons of atmospheric carbon annually through the use of controlled grazing, fire management, fertilizers, and improved cultivars. Finally, U.S. forest lands can currently fix about 250 million metric tons of atmospheric carbon each year. An agroforestry practice like alley cropping adds the woody dimension to accumulate long-term above-ground biomass to cropland or grasslands in addition to adding soil organic matter. Agroforestry improves utilization and recycling of soil nutrients. The tree roots travel much deeper than the annual crops for their moisture and nutrients. In fact, a mathematical model developed for the Victoria Road site in Oregon has predicted that nitrate leaving the rooting zone is reduced by 50 percent when compared to a barley crop without trees. In addition, Tree roots can intercept crop nutrients not utilized by the annual crop that might otherwise leach down into the groundwater. Finally, agroforestry improves wildlife habitat by providing food and cover through the diversity of plants, which creates vertical habitat structures and travel corridors for wildlife movement to connect to other food cover or water resources. To maximize wildlife benefits, utilize native species that provide cover and food. Utilize a mixture of trees and shrubs to help provide vertical structure to habitat. Agroforestry is particularly suited to improve or enhance pollinator habitat. But first, just what exactly is a pollinator? Pollinators are more than just bees, butterflies, and moths, and include all insects, birds, and mammals that facilitate the movement of pollen for plant fertilization. In this picture, we can see a hummingbird moth doing its thing on this delicate flower. 
although pollinators refers to a wide swath of the animal kingdom, we do typically narrow in on pollinators and think of them as bees, butterflies, and insects in general. For the remainder of this presentation, when I refer to pollinators, I am referencing insects broadly, and in some cases, butterflies or bees specifically. Now that we have a better understanding of what pollinators are, let's take a few minutes to learn about why they are important. Pollinators are a keystone species, meaning that many other species depend on them, and if they were to die off, their demise would be disproportionately devastating further up the food chain. Furthermore, some species of plants have co-evolved with a specific pollinator species, such that if one goes, so does the other. Here are a few specific benefits of pollinators and why they are important. Pollinators are particularly important for many commercial crops which we all love and enjoy. This chart shows various commercial crops and their dependence on pollinators versus wind pollination. The first column gives an idea on dependence, while the second column highlights the dependence of some crops on native pollinators that may be better adapted than the European honeybee. This dependence on pollinators equates to billions of dollars attributed to the service of pollination. Yep, just about any way you slice it, pollinators are important to agriculture and allow for the wide choice of foods consumers have today. We've learned what pollinators are, why they are important. So now let's take a look at the current status of pollinators today. The situation is fairly ugly. Specific to monarchs, we've seen an almost 90% decline in monarch numbers the last few years. Specific to managed honeybees, Colony Collapse Disorder, or CCD for short, has devastated beekeepers, resulting in almost half the number of bees we are seeing now compared to 50 years ago. I always like to include this slide to point out that some crops simply have to be pollinated, whether by bees, butterflies, or other insects, or by human hand. Note the high-tech equipment used to accomplish this task. A Dixie cup filled with pollen and the filter end of a cigarette. The decline in pollinator numbers is due to many factors. Leading the way is loss of habitat. The tall grass prairie ecosystem is the most altered landscape of any other on the face of the planet. Habitat is crucial for healthy pollinators. Increased use of pesticides is also a concern, as are disease and parasite issues like varroa mites. So what can we do? Simply put, pollinators need three main things. Access to forage for the entire growing season. Access to nesting sites and protection from pesticides and disturbed habitat. Let's take a deeper look at all three of these. To provide year-long forage for pollinators, select native species as local ecotype as possible, and be sure to select species that will bloom in the three different bloom times of early, mid, and late. Remember, we have many native species of bees and butterflies with varying life cycles. One species of butterfly might emerge in early spring, then feed, mate, lay eggs, and die before the 4th of July. While another moth species might not emerge until summer, then feed, mate, lay eggs, and die closer to Labor Day. Having flowers that are blooming all year long provide the much-needed diversity. Don't forget about the tree component. 
Research conducted by Dr. Doug Tallamy at the University of Delaware on those woody species that support the most Lepidoptera species shows that trees and shrubs are critically important to pollinators, especially in the early part of the year when other flowers are not yet blooming. Trees and shrubs don't only provide food, they also provide critical nesting habitat. Bees can be categorized as being either ground nesters or cavity nesters. Cavity nesters will lay their eggs in bore holes made by other insects and animals, while ground nesters will excavate chambers below ground to lay eggs. Thus sites that don't get tilled are ideal for ground nesting pollinators. Finally, pollinators need protection from pesticides. Whether it's emerald ash borer treatments on trees or spraying crop fields with pesticides, it is important to protect forage and nesting sites from pesticide drift. The Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship maintains a sensitive crops registry for specialty crop growers and beekeepers. Get signed up so that commercial pesticide applicators know where bees and hives as well as specialty crops are being grown in order to minimize pesticide drift and contamination. Don't forget to be proactive and talk with your neighbors and the local co-op so that they know what you are growing and the importance of respecting buffers. Agroforestry has lots of potential to improve the habitat for pollinators. Looking at this example of a riparian buffer system, the native grass and forb component provides forage resources and undisturbed soil for ground nesters, while the shrub and tree component provides forage and nesting sites for cavity nesting pollinators as well as undisturbed soil for ground nesters. The benefits of agroforestry are wide and deep, from production benefits, to water quality benefits, to carbon sequestration, to wildlife habitat. Agroforestry provides all these while still generating pounds of beef, board feet of lumber, bushels of nuts, or buckets of berries. In summary, agroforestry works. For additional information, a number of websites are available to provide more detailed information on agroforestry systems. Here are a few. Finally, special thanks to Jomi Zamora, Extension Educator, Forest Resources with the University of Minnesota Extension, Sibiu Jose, Director, the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri, and Barb Grabner-Kearns with Trees Forever. This presentation was made possible by a USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service grant. For additional questions, you can contact me, Jeff Jensen, at 515-320-6756 or via email at jjensen at treesforever.org. Thanks, and have a good day.